Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Graziano. I'm a coastal resilience specialist with New York Sea Grant, and I'm excited to be here to introduce the first panel of the day. So we're going to kick it off with some background information on the climate risks in the region and the Army Corps proposal and process. So first, we'll be joined by Dr. Bernice Rosenzweig, a professor in the Environmental Science Department at Sarah Lawrence College and a member of the New York Panel on Climate Change. Bernice will provide an overview of what the region's future looks like with more storms, sea level rise, and other climate hazards. And then Colonel Matthew Luzado and his colleagues will walk us through the Army Corps' tentatively selected flood infrastructure plan. And then finally, Kate Boycart, Kate Boycourt, the director of New York, New Jersey Climate Resilient Coasts and Watersheds, will break down the Army Corps process, highlighting opportunities for you and your community to get involved. Um, questions about all three presentations will be answered at the end of the session. So as these presentations are ongoing, you can enter your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. As a reminder, the full agenda for the day and information about all of the speakers can be found on Rebuild by Design's website by following the links that will be dropped in the chat momentarily. Um, and then as an added resource, the US Army Corps of Engineers has compiled a glossary of terms that can be found by following um, the other link that will also be dropped in the chat. All right, and with that, I'm going to pass it right over to Bernice. Okay, so I'm just going to give an overview of climate change impacts in New York City. To start off with that overview, I'm going to talk about New York City's weather hazards landscape. Um, just to give some background on heat and storm hazards and different types of flooding. Um, and then I'm going to go into the projected impacts of climate change on those types of weather hazards. So first, with heat, um, extreme heat is associated with increased mortality. Um, in New York City, particularly during heat waves. So heat waves are events where there are three or more consecutive days with temperatures greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so when we have extended heat waves, um, it's, the data shows that in, what will cause mortality increases. Um, heat in New York City is exacerbated by the urban heat island. Um, and I think we're all kind of familiar with that concept. Basically, conventional roads and building materials generally reflect less sunlight and absorb and re-emit more heat energy than natural surfaces. Um, and so you can see this is a graphic uh, from the Landsat satellite, which shows land surface temperatures. So not the temperature of the air, but the temperature that you feel on the ground surface on July 6, 2020, which was um, during a severe heat wave in New York City. Um, and you can see places like the par Central Park and the parks of Queens and Brooklyn, the wetlands of Staten Island um, are generally cooler because they have increased vegetation. Um, water bodies, because they have a higher heat capacity can moderate um, extreme heat when it occurs just because water takes longer to heat or cool. I'm sorry, this is a bit out of... So um, we're also affected by different types of storms. Um, so those can include tropical cyclones, um, which are powered by warm ocean waters. And so when I say tropical cyclones, I mean a bunch of different types of storms. Some examples include hurricanes, tropical storms, and tropical depressions, which are all tropical cyclones of different magnitudes. Um, New York City is also at risk from other types of storms that aren't tropical. Those are storms that are, if you think about power, the storms powered by differences in air temperature. And we call those baroclinic processes. Um, and they can also be powered by situations where warmer land surfaces, um, where the land surface is warmer than the air that's aloft, or where large air masses um, or fronts um, of cold air and warm air meet each other. Um, and examples of these types of hazardous weather include thunderstorms, um, nor'easters, um, and as well as the post-tropical remnants of hurricanes. So any given storm hazard can be associated with one or more different associated hazards. Um, so those can include uh, rain and storm surge, lightning, wind, tornadoes. I'm primarily going to focus on rain and storm surge because those are the types of hazards that are associated with flooding. Um, so just to give an example of what I mean about the combinations of different hazards, 
that can be associated with any given storm. When we experienced Tropical Storm Irene in 2011, and that was a storm that brought both coastal storm surge and rain. Um, when we experienced post-tropical storm Sandy in 2012, that was associated with storm surge and minimal rain. Um, and the more recent cloudburst associated with the remnants of Hurricane Ida was an extreme rain event with no storm surge. Um, and I said I would focus on flooding. In New York City, we're primarily at risk from pluvial flooding. And that's mostly because most of New York City's natural streams have been filled and replaced with storm sewers, with the exception of the Bronx River and the streams of Staten Island. Um, pluvial flooding occurs when rainfall rates are greater than the rate of sewer drainage and storm infiltration. I mean, here's a graphic that shows basically what I mean by that. So in this case, you know, it's raining very hard. It's raining faster than the catch basins can drain that rainfall to the sewers. It's raining faster than water can infiltrate into the soil of natural surfaces. And you end up getting inundation and flooding as a result. Um, here's just another photo. This was from the cloudburst associated with the Ida remnant storm. Um, and in this case, you can see that water is coming out of the sewers because the sewers are under so much pressure, they're surcharging rather than draining into them. That's um, one of the processes that are associated with pluvial flooding. Parts of New York City are also at risk from flooding from below. Um, and so that's um, getting a lot of attention now. That's what's known as groundwater flooding. Um, and what we mean by groundwater flooding is, you know, it's hard to think about what's going on underground in New York City, but there's water that can accumulate in the pore spaces of parts of the city where there are unconsolidated aquifers. Water can also accumulate in the fractures in fra um, the parts of the city that are underlain by crystalline bedrock. Um, and when water infiltrates into the ground, um, it collects, it, you know, and we describe the level where most of the pore spaces or fractures are saturated and the pressure is as atmospheric as the water table. If you have a wet season and the water table has accumulated so much rainfall that it rises, and sometimes it can rise above the level of the land surface. I mean, when the land surface is inundated, places that are not normally inundated, because the water table has written above their topography, we call that groundwater flooding. That occurs in parts of New York City that are very low lying, like Lindenwood, um, which is located on the Brooklyn and Queens border. Since New York City is a coastal city, we also have to think about flooding from the sea or storm surge. And that's caused primarily from the wind of storms that are passing over the ocean and to a lesser extent, their low pressure. Um, and so storm surge can be caused by any storm that's passing over the ocean, any coastal storm. That includes tropical cyclones like hurricanes, but it can also include extra tropical storms like nor'easters. In any given storm surge event, the magnitude of the storm surge is determined by the coastal storm size, its wind speed, its track, and its translational or travel speed. So that can vary from storm to storm. But when we think about these coastal storms, it's important to remember that the flooding is determined by the storm tide. You know, how much water you experience at every given point in New York City is going to be determined by your elevation, but also by the combination of the storm surge itself and the astronomic high tide when the storm surge approaches New York City. Um, so just to give you a graphic that shows what that means, you can see in this example, here's a storm surge that's approaching, um, and the water level from the storm surge accumulates on top of the normal high tide. In addition, very close to the coast, you also have to worry about waves, which can also increase the water level and cause damages during storm surge events. So when we're thinking about coastal flooding, it's really helpful to think about coastal flood stages. Um, and so those are levels that have been designated based on the impacts of different water levels uh, associated with coastal flooding. This is just an example of the coastal flood stages that have been developed for Jamaica Bay at Inwood. They're developed by the National Weather Service. Um, and you can see in this graphic on the y-axis, I show you the height of the water level. In this case, above what the average lowest high tide of the day would be. So New York City gets two high tides per day. Um, this is the water level above the mean lowest low water. So the average of the lowest of the low high tides during on any given day. Um, and so 
This example comes from the tide gauge, which is located at Inwood in Jamaica Bay. So not the Inwood in Upper Manhattan, but Inwood um, located very close to Rockaway. Um, and the blue line on this graphic shows you the actual wa uh, water levels that were measured at this tide gauge over the past couple of days this week. Um, and so these are measured reference to the mean lowest low water. We can also uh, take the averages of highest high tides over you know, long high tide cycles and develop the mean highest high water. So the difference between the mean lowest low water and the mean highest high water at this particular site is 5.9 feet. If you have a storm surge event um, and the water levels rise 1.6 feet above that you know, average mean high, high water level, um, then you can end up with situations where there are minor flooding. If the water level rises 2.34 feet above mean highest high water, then you end up with situations where there's moderate flooding. Um, and if the water level rises 3.1 feet above mean highest high water, that's delineated as major flooding. So this minor flooding, moderate flooding, and major flooding is really determined by social impacts. Moderate flooding is what we, you know, really are starting to associate it with sunny day flooding when transportation networks and roads are flooded and cause disruptions and there might be uh, minor property damage. Major flooding is associated with really major damage to property, major widespread um, transportation disruptions. And, you know, depending on how high the water level is above that major threshold, catastrophic damage in coastal areas of New York City. Um, so for some context, you know, this is a photo from the flooding event that many communities in Jamaica Bay experienced on December 23rd, 2022, so just a few weeks ago. And during this particular event, the water level was 9.81 feet above the mean lowest low water. So that's 3.91 feet above what the mean highest high tide level would be in this part of New York City. Um, with Sandy in 2012, where there was catastrophic damage in um, Rockaway and many parts of New York City, the water level was 13.7 feet above mean lowest low water. Um, so that's 7.8 feet above what the mean highest high tide would be in this part of New York City. All right, so that's quite a few hazards that New York City is at risk from. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how climate change will affect those weather hazards. And it's, you know, climate change's impacts will really be dependent on how much the, the planet warms. Um, it really depends on how much globally we continue to emit heat trapping gases into the atmosphere. So in this graphic, it shows quite a lot of information, um, but what I want to make clear is that these are different pathways for how climate change globally can progress. So you see on the y-axis on the left, those are the, the net carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and on the y-axis on the right, it shows the associated global warming with those emissions. Um, and so these global warming levels, those are the global average temperature. It's not the temperature that would be experienced on any given day in New York City or anywhere else. It's really just a measure of how much global warming has happened, which obviously would be associated with more climate change. Um, and so I'm highlighting three thresholds here, 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is you know, really the global target of um, managing greenhouse gas emissions to avoid serious impacts from climate change. Two degrees Celsius is another target that's really associated with you know, the beginning of catastrophic impacts associated with climate change. And five degrees Celsius is a, a threshold of global warming that would be associated with really unmitigated greenhouse gas emissions through the 21st century, um, along with probably triggering some tipping points for global warming that would cause the Earth system to re also release more greenhouse gases. Um, so when we talk about reducing global emissions to prevent you know, those worst scenarios of climate change, that's what we refer to as climate change mitigation. And when we talk about what society does, you know, so that can include both infrastructure and policy changes to better manage the impacts of climate change, that's climate change adaptation. Um, and so in general, we, um, this is a summary figure from the New York City Panel on Climate Change most recent 2019 report that shows how climate change across the globe is gonna 
is projected to increase uh, impact New York City. Um, and so the left graphic shows mean annual temperatures in New York City and how that will be impacted. Um, and the, the different colors are associated with different pathways of global warming. And so you can see, depending on you know, what pathway the globe takes in terms of greenhouse emissions, that's going to determine generally how much New York City is going to warm on average. Um, it's the same with precipitation on annual time scale. So generally how much rain New York City gets per year. New York City is projected to be generally wetter, um, but it will really vary depending on how which pathway of global warming the planet follows. In terms of the hazards in New York City, it's helpful to consider metrics of more extreme events. Um, so when thinking about climate change and extreme heat, um, we are pretty confident that there is going to be more extremely hot days. Um, and we can think about a few key metrics, like for example, the frequency of heat wave events with heat wave events defined as you know, three or more days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the mean event duration, so how long on average those heat waves last, and the mean event intensity, so what the that maximum temperature is during heat waves, if you, you know, average those all out, that's the mean event intensity. Um, and you can see, you know, there is some variation depending on which pathway of global climate change the planet follows, um, but in general, heat waves are expected to become more frequent. Um, especially under scenarios of more global warming, they're going to become longer just because, you know, simply they're more hot days are more frequently occurring. And when heat waves happen, the hotter days during those heat waves are going to be even more um, warm. So, you know, you think about the hottest day on any given heat wave, it will be much warmer, you know, in a climate changed world. In terms of rainfall, there's actually a lot more uncertainty. It's just more difficult to predict how the processes that drive precipitation will change with climate change. Um, we know that New York City is generally projected to become wetter. And we know that when conditions are favorable for rain, rainfall can potentially fall at higher rates. This is simply because warmer air can hold more moisture. But warmer temperatures can also amplify the dynamics of thunderstorms. So, you know, in addition to, you know, the air having more moisture to potentially precipitate out, the thunderstorms will be more powerful and can support greater precipitation rates at any time. Those dynamics are really complex. And so there's, you know, while we are generally confident that precipitation rates are going to increase with climate change, there's a lot of uncertainty about how much in any given place like New York City. Um, so that presents a real challenge for adaptation. We can't say that rainfall or extreme rain events are going to increase 20% or 15%, um, which makes it very difficult to think about how we're going to redesign our infrastructure systems to address more extreme rain with climate change. Um, climate change is also obviously associated with sea level rise. So global sea levels will rise as the ocean expands and land ice melts. Um, and so New York City is actually unfortunately part of the mid-Atlantic sea level rise hotspot. So if you think of the relative water levels, you know, thinking about how sea level rise will vary across the planet, um, and also thinking about how the land surface changes um, due to geologic processes, the local relative sea level rise in New York City is much higher than the global average. Um, so these are sea level rise projections that were developed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, they are consistent with the sea level rise projections that were developed by the New York City Panel on Climate Change as well. Um, and so these show the relative sea level rise, so how much you know, sea level is expected to rise relative to our land surface in New York City for three potential pathways. On the left is the low pathway, in the middle is the low intermediate pathway, um, and on the right is the intermediate pathway. Um, and just for context, this is the 1.8 feet um, sea level rise projection that's used in the feasibility study uh, that the Army Corps developed. Um, and you can see where that lines along these three potential pathways of sea level rise. Um, also for context, I'm providing, you know, the threshold of water level that would result in major flooding in using Jamaica Bay as an example, but obviously this would be an issue in other communities of New York City with the highest high tide. 
So with an increase in tidal levels of 2.34 feet, you know, with your average high tide on any given day, there would be inundation. Um, so you can see it really depends on the scenario. Under the low scenario, we'd be able to avoid that through the 21st century. Um, under the low intermediate scenario, it's possible that we would exceed that threshold um, in during the 21st century. And with the intermediate scenario, it's um, definitely possible that we would exceed that uh, level by the 2070s. Um, and so for uh, some additional context, I'm highlighting a, a moderate flood event. So, you know, we generally consider this like nuisance level flooding at this point, but it does cause impacts in low-lying communities of New York City that occurred just this week. So, you know, there were impacts, but they weren't particularly noticeable. They weren't particularly catastrophic. But those types of, you know, increasingly frequent flooding impacts that we experience in our low-lying communities are going to become more frequent due to sea level rise. So when you have these events where there's a high tide and generally, you know, what would be a moderate storm surge as a result of a coastal storm passing by, it doesn't have to be a major hurricane, just a typical uh, coastal storm that we experience, you know, that water level is going to be increased by some extent due to sea level rise. And we're, you know, at this point from regular storms, we are already pretty close to the major thresholds that can cause, you know, widespread impacts. Um, so depending on how much sea level rise, that's going to determine how much, you know, these right now nuisance storms are going to end up being very impactful events that happen increasingly frequently. When we're thinking about sea level rise, we know that some communities in New York City are at risk from groundwater flooding during very wet seasons, but sea level rise can also impact groundwater flooding. Um, and that will really depend on the magnitude of sea level rise. Um, so from just basic groundwater theory, groundwater um, is determined by boundary conditions um, along any different topographic profile. And the sea level at the coast serves as a boundary condition. So as the sea level rises, the water table will rise along with it unless there's nothing to stop it. If you consider uh, you know, the situation where this was allowed to go on indefinitely, um, ultimately the water table would rise if it's not stopped by any adaptation measures or it's not stopped by topographic drainage um, to the level of the sea level. So you can think about under this really idealized case, if the sea rises three feet, the water table will rise three feet with it. And so in very low lying parts of the New York City where the water table is you know, only a few feet below the land surface, those places would be inundated from below with sea level rise. It really comes down to you know, the topography and infrastructure which becomes quite complicated and also the characteristics of our geology. So how permeable the, the, um, the aquifers are under New York City um, and so that will determine the rate at which these processes occur. And that's what really remains uncertain at this point. It could be a matter where there's only a lag of, you know, a few years after sea level rises, or it could be hundreds or thousands of years that determine how long these processes take. Um, the impacts of sea level rise on water tables is also going to be highly impacted by our urban infrastructure in New York City. So in communities in New York City that are vulnerable to groundwater pumping, uh, groundwater flooding already, some pumps are really often required for dewatering of basements and even of the first floors um, in some properties in New York City. Um, rising water tables with sea level rise, even if they don't inundate the land surface, will flood basements and other subterranean infrastructure. So thinking about this, um, you know, when we think about coastal flood stages, I showed you all of these harbor water levels that will result in flooding, but these are not set in stone. These can be changed through adaptation measures. So adaptation measures like raising properties, um, raising, raising roads and things like that will mean that higher water levels will result in less property impacts and these thresholds for what water levels will result in flooding can be changed. Um, it's also important to think about how groundwater will interact with those adaptation changes, though. 
Um, so when the sea level rises, for example, all different types of floodings can um, interact with each other and cause combined impacts. So if you think about a situation where sea level is rising, um, you can have in increased infiltration into our infrastructure, which will reduce um, the ability of storm sewers and storm drains to um, drain uh, precipitation and stormwater when you have a rain event that occurs. Um, and so even if you don't have a situation where you have a storm surge, just the sea level rise and the higher tides can make our adaptation efforts less um, able to drain rain when um, extreme rain events occur. There's also a lot that we can do to um, mitigate the uh, climate change and prevent those more catastrophic impacts for taking place. Um, so climate change would mitigate, reduce the likelihood that we experience these higher sea level rise scenarios. Um, so when I showed these scenarios earlier, um, I didn't talk about you know, how they were associated with global warming, but it really comes down to how much we allow the planet to warm. So going back to you know, this graphic of potential pathways of climate change, if we're able to keep global warming you know, below this 1.5 degrees threshold or close to that 1.5 degrees threshold, um, it's still likely that some sea level rise is locked in. So there's a 92% chance that that low scenario that you see in the left graphic can take place. Um, there's a 37% chance, you know, if we're able to rapidly mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, that that low intermediate scenario will take place. But it would be less than 1% chance that, the, you know, the, the intermediate scenario would happen if we are able to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If we allow global warming to progress to two degrees of warming globally by the end of the century, um, then there's a 50% chance that that low intermediate uh, scenario will be exceeded so that we'll have water levels higher than that in New York City and a you know a two percent chance of the intermediate level um, and you know there's also some probability that it, the water levels would obviously be, be between those thresholds and if we allow the globe to continue to warm unabated then there's greater than a 99 percent chance that will exceed this low intermediate scenario so the scenario where by the 2070s it's very likely that you know Places in New York City would, is in, that are low-lying like Jamaica Bay would be at major flood stage or what's the equivalent of major flood stage today with every high tide um, on average. And even a 23% chance that we would exceed that intermediate scenario. So in summary, in New York City, climate change is projected to result in more hot days, more intense precipitation and sea level rise. Um, adaptation will be necessary to manage the impacts of these amplified hazards. Um, and so, you know, global warming and climate change impact um, can really be mitigated by preventing the worst scenarios of global warming and rapidly reducing greenhouse gases. Next up is Colonel Lozano. Okay, great. How do you hear me, Amy? All good. All right, outstanding. Hey, first of all, I want to thank uh, Rebuild by Design by inviting us to this. You know, the Corps of Engineers is, is tasked by Congress with this responsibility for carrying out their direction uh, to protect cities like uh, New York and, and New Jersey. And it's something that we take very seriously. And you know, we want to encourage this kind of discussion and participation from the public and from experts in the fields. And I have a team right now uh, watching this, uh, learning from what you guys uh, can inform us on because we are currently in our public comment period until March 7th. And so this is a great time for us to receive this feedback and then utilize it uh, in the future uh, study development. Um, so, you know, I have to do one quick pitch about the Corps of Engineers. You know, we are really happy to have this responsibility to actually build these projects. And it takes a great team of professionals that actually execute this work. 
And, you know, if anybody out there is interested in being part of the USACE team, we are hiring. So I've got to put that out there. If you want to be one of the individuals that makes these actions and builds these structures and makes them uh, facilitate them to protect the American people, that's what we do. All right, Bryce, next slide. Hey, so as we're in our public comment period, I think Bryce bring up slides now. As we're in our public comment period, you know, I'm, I'm excited that everybody is participating. We've had many public meetings already, and, you know, we've got ones coming up. We have a public meeting uh, that is virtual February 1st from 2 to 4 p.m., one February, a virtual one February 6th, 6 to 8 p.m., and February 8th, we're having an in-person one at the Liberty Science Center, both in the uh, afternoon and evening time. Because our whole goal during this public comment period is, in, is to increase the dialogue with the public, ensure the accountability of what we're doing, and empower uh, the public to have a role in the development of this study. So what you're going to get is a real shortened version of what we, we provide uh, to the public when we have these comment periods. And uh, with that, uh, Bryce, next slide. Go, Go ahead, Bryce. Important things to know. All right, so next slide. There's a couple important things to note about this study. The first of which is that this tentatively selected plan is preliminary and conceptual. At this point, during this public comment period, we everything is still on the table with regards to what can change in what we are designing and producing to protect New York, New Jersey. Bryce, go to Slide four. So right now, we are currently in the planning phase of things. And so the thing to understand is we are still very early in the process. And the reality is now is the time to make those recommendations and give us that feedback that we need, because now is the time that we can significantly change things. You know, after this public comment period, we have to start solidifying what the plan is going to be going forward, because we have a requirement to submit what is called chief's report to Congress for them to review and either authorize uh, in the future. So your feedback is critical. You'll note I'll cover a little bit about how to provide us that feedback and learn more about the study here. Uh, next slide, please. So want to call out, we've made an extensive effort uh, online to ensure the ability that everybody has access to the information regarding the study. So we do our, our public comment periods uh, in person for anybody who does not have that access. Uh, we create uh, multi-language uh, flyers and brochures. Uh, we have multi-language uh, elements on the internet. And this uh, website will take you to a storyboard that, that brings you down into the study. You can pick, you can type in your address and see what, what uh, impacts or what potential uh, feature will be near your community. And so you have an understanding can and ask informed questions as to what we are projecting uh, for the study in the future. So I encourage everyone to not only look at it yourself, but pass the word of this ability to have this capability to see what's going on in their communities and share that information uh, throughout. Because we've found that some of the most effective communication is by word of mouth. Still, even in today's technology, there's still a lot of word of mouth uh, going on out there. So we appreciate that. Okay, next slide. So the public comment involvement opportunities. I get asked all the time, is this the only time the public has an opportunity to uh, give us information? Uh, and what I want to point out is we've done this two times already, both first in 2017 with the NEPA scoping, and then in 2019 with the release of the interim report. And we received a great amount of public feedback uh, during that time frame that then informed our selection of the tentatively selected plan. And that's where we're at now. We've selected a tentatively selected plan and we need your feedback with regards to what we are proposing and what maybe we missed or what we could add. Um, we need that feedback now, but that's still not everything uh, that is available. So coming up after uh, we then go into, we complete the study, and we produce the chief's reports, like I mentioned. And then once that's done, then we'll have to go into a tier two environmental impact assessment if the project is authorized. 
And one of the key points I always want to point out is that voting is a key and essential portion of public involvement in this process, because everyone must remember the Corps of Engineers only builds what Congress authorizes, first authorizes, and then funds. So key public involvement includes voting for those officials that you think support your interests in this particular area, because they are the ones that ultimately select and choose to go forward with this project. We make the recommendation with your feedback, they make the final decision. So vote. Uh, after that process, as we get through the pre-construction uh, and engineering design phase, there'll be multiple features. This, this project is so large that there'll be multiple construction efforts around the city. And each of these will have its own design period and public comment period associated with those particular features. So as we're designing a, a seawall or a nature-based feature in one particular area, we will reach out to the public and say, hey, we're getting, we're finalizing the actual design of this project. What do you think? And so there'll be another opportunity then. And then finally, during construction, my team does a great job of reaching out to the community and informing folks, this is what's happening. Um, this is what you expect to see while construction is ongoing. And we also receive feedback from the public. Often we get comments like, well, you know, we don't like the trucks driving this direction on this road because that's bad for our kids on that day. We can take that feedback and adjust what the contractor does to meet some of those needs that are raised by the public. So the public comment and involvement period lasts throughout the duration of the project. This is not the only time, but this is a critical time as far as delineating for Congress what our recommendation is. Okay, next slide. So one of my goals uh, when, when we started this was to ensure that we provide a feedback loop to the public with regards to how we interpret and incorporate your public feedback. And so I've kind of laid out the reality is that we receive many, many, many comments, thousands of comments, and kind of represented on the left hand of the screen there is all those, those comments that we get. And so then we have the difficult job of parsing through those and figuring out which ones are most effective and can be utilized and incorporated into the study. So we find in step one, we look for those common ideas and concerns that, that cross the gamut of communities and individuals to ensure that we pull out something that is that can be done, that's executable, because that gets us into step two. Not everything that is recommended by the public is feasible for us to address. Uh, we have to ensure many different things. The recommendation has to be have no conflict with local, state, or federal laws or policies. Uh, we must be authorized to do that kind of work. We've got to have the technology to do it it cannot create a problem for somebody else. There's a lot of times we'll say, hey, why don't you just do this? Um, but the reality is sometimes doing that impacts another community elsewhere. And so we have to make sure that that is uh, equity, uh, that, it, that we do that equitably across everyone involved. Uh, it can't be cost prohibitive. There's a lot of great ideas of technology and stuff out there that may not be fully developed or that are extremely expensive that we cannot take into account quite yet. It has to be done in a timely manner and it has to be flexible to future uncertainties. And finally, like I said, no negative impacts on environment, endangered species, historical or cultural sites, local economies, view sheds, traffic patterns. There's many, many considerations that we have to take into account. And once we take all those ideas from the public and run them through that filter of what is feasible, we come out with some real key nuggets that we're able to execute. Next slide, please, Greg. So we take those and then we're able to incorporate those back into the plan. And some great examples of that, and one of the best examples of that was coming out of the previous public comment period when we were, we, were, we, re we presented all of the alternatives. And there was significant concern about induced flooding on communities that may be impacted by some of these larger features. And we took that into account as we developed the tentatively selected plan. And that was an example of how that feedback was, that feedback loop fed directly back into our study process and was incorporated in the tentatively selected plan, as well as many of the things that we're doing now for public comment. I've, I see a couple of folks online now that I've had discussions with about improving our public communications uh, process. 
Uh, I think we've taken many of these steep steps that you see here. We were asked to extend the public comment period. You see it's been moved out to March 7th to allow everybody to have an appropriate amount of time to provide feedback. Uh, we've improved our web design and our communications ability. Uh, we're working with many groups out there, many of you who are on right now, to ensure that we do our public meetings and our virtual meetings at the right times and in the right places to meet all the affected communities, no matter their access to, uh, to the technology or, or other things. We want to make it accessible to everyone. Um, so we continue to do that outreach. Uh, this is a key part of that, and that's why I'm here now. So let's get into the study a little bit. Next slide. So the New York Harbor and Tributary Study came out of the North Atlantic Coastal Comprehensive Study. That was an analysis done of the entire North Atlantic to identify key areas that were at greatest risk uh, to, to storms. And the New York, New Jersey area was identified and created this need for this study, which is one of the largest, most comprehensive studies the Corps of Engineers uh, has done. Uh, covers 2,100 square miles, uh, 900 miles of affected clothesline, 25 counties, 16 million people. So we take very seriously the fact that this study affects so many people and their lives and their livelihood uh, in what we are doing. So we have to take into account the significant life safety risk to 275 structures in potentially impacted areas. Um, we also take into account existing coastal storm resiliency projects that other agencies are doing from the state, the city, counties, there are many people working to mitigate the impacts. And we need to make sure that this study doesn't, doesn't create gaps in that protection, but also does not overlap that protection because that would be an inefficiency uh, that we don't want to, to do. Uh, so the study of the scope, it's a $19 million study. Uh, we are non-federal partners are New York and New Jersey uh, and a 50-50 share as they work with us through this process and will ultimately also be the non-federal sponsors should Congress decide that this project be authorized and funded for construction. Uh, the study schedule, the biggest date that we're tracking right now is the March 7th deadline uh, for the public comment period. And I, I encourage everybody uh, to be involved. All right, next slide. We're not gonna go into all the other alternatives. Our focus is on alternative 3B, but just to highlight the fact that we looked at a broad spectrum of possibilities going all the way from primarily only water-based surge barrier type features to only land-based uh, measures and, and tried to find that sweet spot in the middle that gave us the best um, ability to protect the American people. And that ended up being alternative 3B. Next slide. So some of the key things to note is that we were charged by Congress to protect against you know, the, the hundred year flood and a ballpark approximately, that's a, that's a 15 foot storm surge. And what you see in the purple there are those impacted inundation areas that would be impacted by a storm surge such as that. And in doing that, it kind of restricts us to the types and systems that we can use to provide that protection. And we've found that while we try to incorporate natural and nature-based features as much as possible, one of the biggest challenges we run into is there are very few natural and nature-based features that are able to mitigate the impact of a 15-foot storm surge. So while we will continue to incorporate natural and nature-based features into other areas of the project where there is uh, um, secondary flooding or daylight flooding that occurs or residual flooding uh, in, in low or high tide events, uh, it, they cannot support the massive impact of a 15 foot uh, storm surge. Okay, next slide. So ultimately, how do we come down to choosing uh, 3B? Well, the reality is Congress has directed that we use a cost benefit analysis. It is the, the most objective way to analyze
All right, um, looks like we're having tech issues. I couldn't tell if that was on my side or on their side. Um, so please just stand by while we sort out these tech issues. Thank you. We can hear you, Katie. You can hear me. Okay, good. I was. I thought that was my internet. Um, so let's just give it a, a moment. Um, Bryce, are you able to oh, jump in? We can. I'm back. I'm back. Oh, there you are. Okay. Bryce. All right. Welcome. We missed you. Uh, God bless technology. All right. Hey. So, um, so the other considerations that we take into account, in addition to just cost, is the ecosystems, the wildlife. And then the human factors. We take a really close look, and we'll talk a little bit later in the environmental side of things, is how do we maintain a sense of community? How do we maintain connectedness and the quality of life while building these features? Because we're very sensitive to the fact that sea walls could be seen as, as dividing a community or taking away from the essence of the community. And we take a very close look at how we, we mitigate that. Um, it really is a balance that we're trying to strike. You know, how do we protect the people without diminishing their quality of life? And it, it's a challenge for us to achieve. And that's why we love having feedback from, from folks like you to help us achieve that balance. Next slide. All right, so ultimately, alternative 3B uh, is a, includes 2.2 uh, miles of storm surge barriers, about 50 miles of shore-based features, um, about 11 miles of induced flooding mitigation uh, features and a risk reduction features of about 18 miles. It has a first cost of about $52 billion. So this is a big project. And as I mentioned before, this has to be authorized by Congress and then funded by Congress. So again, we are developing a recommendation and that recommendation is 3B. And in green is what you'll see is the areas that will be protected by this uh, proposed project. So one, a couple of things that I want to point out before I have Bryce run through the different features associated with this project. Number one, we are very sensitive to our mandate by the administration regarding Justice 40. And while that mandate is an enterprise total mandate, the Corps of Engineers must achieve that 40% uh, attention to environmental justice communities. We're proud to say that at this point, this project is well over 40% in addressing environmental justice communities. And that may flex as time goes on, uh, but right now we're, we're well above 40% and, and we're happy about that. Uh, natural and nature-based features. As I've talked about before, the focus of natural and nature-based features is for uh, infrequent and induced flooding that may occur, um, but with regards to stopping a 15 foot storm surge, uh, we do have to use uh, many uh, gray structures. Sea level rise, we get asked the question often, what are you gonna do to adapt to sea level rise? The reality is every design that we will do, we will look at ways to make it so it can be adapted in the future. It's one of the number one things that we can do when we build the foundation for a sea wall or a structure, we build that foundation strong enough to hold more than we put on top of it now. So if we have a foundation that holds a five foot wall, we build a foundation that can hold a 10 foot wall so that in the future, the additional five feet could be added. All right, so we're making these structures adaptable in the future as we learn more about sea level rise and the rate at which it progresses. And finally, we're very sensitive to the reality that some of these storm, uh, coastal storm resiliency features are not the most attractive things in the world. And when we get to design, we're gonna work closely with the community to find out ways to offer the protection without breaking up the community with, and minimizing effects on view sheds and minimizing impact to access. There is going to be impacts, but we can find ways to minimize those impacts and provide the same level of protection. And with that, Bryce, I'm gonna kick it over to you and he's gonna walk us through some of the key features associated with 3B. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Thank you, sir. Uh, so Alternative 3B has eight primary features, um, five of which involve storm surge gates and three are shoreline-based only measures. Uh, I'll go through each of those eight in detail. The two largest by far are, are, uh, are a storm surge gate system 
uh, along with risk reduction features, which aren't shown on this graphic, I'll show them in a minute, uh, that cover the backside of Staten Island and northern coastally affected New Jersey, the inner por portions of it, the area shaded here in green, with storm surge gates on the Kilvin Coal and the Arthur Kill Channel uh, at their mounds, uh, barely seeable on this uh, graphic. Uh, another large feature is Southern Brooklyn and Queens encompassing Jamaica Bay, which has been studied and, and identified by the Corps numerous times previously as the best approach for how to deal with coastal storm risk in, in that area, uh, involving a very long stretch of shoreline based measures and storm surge gates uh, through that section. Um, then we have three shoreline based measures in uh, Jersey City, downtown Manhattan, East Harlem. And then we have smaller storm surge gates on Flushing Creek in Queens, Newtown Creek between Queens and Brooklyn, and Guanas Creek. So I'll show a little bit more detail on those as well. There's also a few um, uh, induced flooding mitigation features. So one area doesn't get impacted adversely from uh, features done in some other area. Uh, Breezy Point community is one. A few locations around Kipps Bay and along the East River and Harlem River in the South Bronx. Um, and the alternatives that have storm surge barriers in them, uh, Alternative 3B actually has the least amount of induced flooding features, which kind of speaks to how well it kind of fits within the estuary. It also uh, complements very nicely a lot of those other projects that the Colonel showed on that prior slide of, that are underway and included as part of Alternative 1. So there's not a lot of redundancy with this plan. Uh, the other point that I'd like to make uh, before getting into the details of those eight features is that of the 63% of the, the study are directly benefited. That's the geographic area that would be flooded by that 1% flood event with intermediate sea level rise. Um, so the areas that are shown here in red are part of that 37%, but it's worth noting that a fair percentage of that area shown in red, particularly like in Northern Monmouth County, there are a number of projects that have and are being done in that area uh, by the Corps. They just aren't built to that 1% design event with the intermediate sea level rise. Uh, so those areas are shown in red. So it just doesn't meet that same criteria that we have uh, set initially for our evaluation purposes uh, of these different alternatives. And all that being said, I, I would also caution that, you know, the features that we have now are a framework. There's a lot of details left to be worked out in them, uh, whether there's additional measures, uh, natural nature-based, structural, non-structural that might be uh, feasible within some of these feature areas. Um, so I would caution that what we have here is a, an initial uh, concept and that it's a framework. There's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that have yet to be worked out and filled in. Um, but that being said, just to go in a little bit more detail on the, uh, the features that we have, uh, that large feature that I mentioned, the Arthur Kill and Kilgun Coal Storm Surge Barrier System uh, being on the largest channels. Uh, we've assumed for all the storm surge barriers that they would be operating at the same elevation in terms of a, a closure criteria for the storm surge gates, uh, which is plus seven uh, feet NAVD 88, which is about mean sea level. So a little bit above the normal uh, uh, higher high tide conditions. Um, but, so. Uh, for that reason, uh, since the storm surge gates wouldn't close for every storm, uh, we have behind the storm surge gates what we have identified as risk reduction features, which you can see the, the little dotted areas uh, in along the Arthur Kill, Newark Bay, and Safe and Hackensack Rivers. Um, now, being that these gates are on some of the major shipping channels, we have done some coordination with navigational interests, and there's more to be done there. Uh, but it's for the reason that, you know, those channels can't close for every frequent storm that we need to have those risk reduction features, especially um, in, in this feature. Um, just to show kind of what the, uh, an artist rendering of these storm surge gates might look like, you can see the Kilvin Coal Barrier on the upper left, the Arthur Kill Barrier in the lower right. Uh, you can see the size. Again, this is all designed to that 1% storm event. Uh, with the intermediate sea level rise, but that's subject to change and optimization as the study goes forward. If we go forward with alternative 3B, uh, they have about a half a mile of tie into high ground with the Kilvin Coal Barrier uh, and a similar amount of tie into high ground uh, with shoreline based measures in uh, the Arthur Kill as well. You can see the elevation, and you'll see that there's a variation in the crest elevation 
of the different storm surge barriers in alternative 3B. And that's because that 1% storm event does not cause the same water level throughout this vast study area. It's varied. Uh, the, the risk profile, if you will, is, is uh, it varies depending on where you're located. Some are as far worse than others. So in terms of the risk reduction features, this kind of shows that the, these are the areas that would be flooded by that plus seven when the gates would not be closed on the Arthur Kill and the KVK, basically the area shaded in red. And in this, you can see there's actually a secondary gate that we have on the Hackensack River, and again, to address the low-lying areas in the Hackensack Meadowlands. But then there's a, a series of plug walls, and these are all smaller structures that are at the plus 10 elevation. So from ground level, you're talking something that's in you know, a few feet to five feet type elevation, typically uh, throughout the study area. Again, just to kind of address the, the more frequent flood events when the gates aren't closed. They also have the added benefit that even when the gates are closed for a more severe and moderate uh, storm event, there's enough water in the Newark Bay, Arthur Kill, and as you'll see also in Jamaica Bay, um, water that can be sloshed around from the storm winds itself that can cause uh, minor flooding uh, behind those storm surge gates. So these risk reduction features also have the added benefit of addressing those risks as well when the gates are closed during a more severe or moderate storm event. So you can see there's a number of them that we have located in the various areas. Uh, basically the areas shaded in red are where the risk reduction features address those risks and the areas shaded in green are the areas that are addressed by the larger gates on the earth kill and the Kilvin coal barriers. Uh, there's also a few non-structural measures that we have identified in this feature. Uh, basically 158 structures where it doesn't make sense to have a more larger structural measure. So we think in these areas, some type of a non-structural application or maybe a ring wall type application around those structures might make the most feasible approach for that. So that other large feature that I mentioned that uh, runs along South Brooklyn and uh, South Queens encompassing Jamaica Bay. Uh, it's been studied and evaluated by the court a number of times. Um, you can see a rendering of what that might look like uh, at the Coney Island boardwalk there on the side. And I would just caution that these are just initial concepts on these renderings. Uh, they can only improve and get better from here. But in that area, we have assumed a, an elevated promenade, which you can see in that lower left um, along the boardwalk. Uh, again, it's all been heightened. Uh, the height is designed to that 1% flood event with intermediate sea level rise. You can also see that in Jamaica Bay, there's also a number of those risk reduction features uh, at the head of bay there at the eastern end, uh, a number of smaller gate structures along Shaw Tree, uh, Shellbank Basin, Haw Tree Basin uh, there in northern uh, Jamaica Bay, and a number of shoreline-based measures around Broad Channel uh, and, and such. The, um, uh, again, these, risk reduction features are designed to operate in tandem with and complement the larger storm surge barriers that would exist on the Jamaica Bay Inlet. So if the Jamaica Bay Inlet barrier is operated less frequently, we would need more risk reduction features, or conversely, if we it's operated more frequently, we would need less risk reduction features. But regardless, we want to make sure that whatever's put in place, as the Colonel mentioned, is designed so that it can be adaptable because sea level rise is such a large uncertainty going into the future and climate change that whatever we do design for, which is going to be some combination of a design storm and some assumed sea level rise, uh, the future might have some different plans in mind. Mother Nature always throws curveballs. So we wanna make sure that we can adapt whatever we put in place more easily and uh, take into account those other risks or, or changes as time evolves. So this is kind of a rendering of what that storm surge gate might look like at the inlet to Jamaica Bay. Uh, you can also see the uh, uh, different uh, uh, dimensions on what the size of the gate is. The gate has not only navigable gates in the middle uh, for ship passage, but then auxiliary gates on the two sides to maximize the amount of tidal exchange into the bay uh, right there next to the Marine Parkway or Gil Hodges Bridge is the current location. And then it's hard to see on this graphic, but there's also um, basically levees and flood wall types and, and reinforced dunes tying into high ground at the toe of uh, Rockway uh, Peninsula. And then going along, uh, Sheepshead Bay has another a storm surge gate structure, Garrison Creek, uh, and then the, the shoreline base measures tying up to high ground at the Verisome Narrows. So in terms of the three uh, shoreline based only features that we have, 
uh, in Alternative 3D. Uh, this uh, basically shows the layout. And again, it's very preliminary, very conceptual uh, of a shoreline-based measure in downtown Manhattan. Uh, there's a number of projects that are being planned in that area that we need to coordinate with. Uh, the financial district and seaport uh, plans by the city. Uh, Battery Park City is moving forward with construction in that area. Um, so we need to kind of uh, amend our plans to kind of uh, tailor to what they, they have already developed. Um, the goal of this study is never to impede or interfere with anybody else's plans, but more serve as a safety net for areas that still have a substantial amount of remaining unaddressed coastal storm risk. You can see here on the renderings that are on the right side of this graphic, kind of what the flood wall might look like in this area. And again, that's just an initial concept. Maybe it's an elevated promenade. There's a lot of other types of tools in our toolbox that can be used there, but preliminarily just because of the space constraints and the, the high cost of real estate, we've assumed the flood wall. But again, everything is subject to change. The main point is that we're saying something needs to be done to address coastal storm risk in this area, downtown Manhattan. And this is our first concept they can only improve here, and that's largely based on the feedback that we receive from the public. So uh, that's why we're so critically asking for that feedback. Uh, one of the other considerations that we have in this area that's pretty substantial is that there's a pretty um, uh, severe limitation that the city has on interior drainage. While we have assumed some costs in all of our features and all of our plans for dealing with interior drainage uh, that occurs during these storm events when the storm surge occurs, uh, we understand that in this particular area, downtown Manhattan, it's at a severe uh, limitation, so there might need to be additional enhancements to that system. So there, there's a lot of things trying to uh, pull in together in terms of developing our plans. Another shoreline-based measure only is in East Harlem. Uh, you can see there along the Harlem River as well as the East River with an elevated promenade and flood wall sections. Um, uh, you can see uh, the story map that the Colonel mentioned earlier. You can actually zoom in on, on more of almost a street level view of what these features, uh, where they're located and such. But you can see a couple of renderings of what they might look like with the elevated promenade there along the East River on the left side, and then along the Harlem River uh, on the right side, also even during a storm event there on that lower right area. But it's basically about five miles of shoreline based measures uh, addressing coastal storm risk in this area. You can also see that there is on the other side of the Harlem River an induced flooding mitigation feature in South Bronx because this is one of the areas where, based on our modeling, which needs to be uh, more of it done uh, to refine it better, uh, but preliminarily indicates that this area would impact be impacted from induced flooding. That is to say, they would have worse flooding uh, than if there were none of these features in place. So, so that one area doesn't benefit at the cost of another, we've incorporated these induced flooding mitigation features. As you can see there in South Bronx, there's also some further up on the Harlem River, as well as further down on the East River and then Breezy Point, as I showed earlier. The last shoreline based only measure is Jersey City, uh, basically a series of flood walls and elevated promenades. Again, these are very initial renderings you can kind of see there in the Jersey City at York Street, as well as around Liberty State Park. Uh, subject to change in terms of location, elevation, the type of measure that's employed. Um, but it basically involves about 43,000 feet and dovetails up with a project that New Jersey DEP is doing as a rebuild by design uh, in the Hoboken area to the north of it. And in terms of those three smaller storm surge barriers, there's one that we have on Newtown Creek, uh, Gowanus Creek, and Flushing Creek, which I'll show graphics of. You can kind of see this uh, graphic that's shown on the far right. Uh, is actually, uh, of all the renderings that we have, this is the one we have the most um, uncertainty about in that we're not sure the elevation of the park that we use to estimate the height of the wall for that 1% storm event uh, is based off of an older LIDAR set of, uh, set of LIDAR data. And the park may have been elevated subsequently. And so this flood wall that's being shown there in the seawall might be our, uh, falsely higher than it actually would be for that 1% flood event. But regardless, the location of that seawall, uh, its elevation is all subject to change. The real point of alternative uh, 3B in the plan that we have is to say that this area that's shown in the middle graphic, that's uh, shaded in green, has high coastal storm risk. And we need to do something to tie off the mouth of Newtown Creek and to tie off the high ground 
uh, to protect that area from those coastal storm risk now and as they get exacerbated into the future from further sea level rise. Uh, you can see that the elevation of this is a little bit lower than the Kilgan Coal and North Kilgate. The uh, East River actually has some of the lower uh, storm risk profile uh, throughout the study area because the East River serves as a major conduit for releasing storm surge from either Western Wyoming the Sound or the Atlantic into the other during storm events since they're at, out of phase with each other um, in the tide. So uh, it involves about three miles of shoreline based measures, as, as you can see there. Uh, and it also has a very large wastewater treatment plant uh, that New York City DEP runs that we think the discharge might have to be relocated outside the gate so that that plant itself, uh, along with some of this combined sewer overflows, doesn't cause flooding during storm event. Again, we have incorporated interior drainage costs as part of all of our features on all of our plans, but that might need a little bit more evaluation, particularly in this feature. Uh, another one uh, that we have uh, Gowanus Creek uh, and Red Hook uh, storm surge barrier building off the plans that the city has advanced for the Red Hook area. You can see a rendering of what a flood wall might look like there uh, around Cafe Street uh, in Red Hook uh, with the storm surge barrier, barrier assumed on the Gowanus Creek Canal addressing flood risk for, the, for this um, area in uh, Red Hook and Gowanus Brooklyn. The last feature that I want to go over before I turn it over to Chris Escarpa to talk about the environmental evaluations that we've been doing uh, is Flushing Creek. Uh, it also has a, a, about a two mile set of um, tie ins to high ground with a, a storm surge gate at the mouth of Flushing Creek, basically addressing coastal storm risk for the area shaded in green. You can kind of see what a flood wall with a little bit of a levee structure might look like along that area. Again, very initial concepts. The real point being is that we think something needs to be done in this area uh, to tie off the creek and to tie it off to high ground. And these are just initial concepts of what might be done in those areas uh, and all subject to change based on feedback that we receive from the public, stakeholders, other agencies uh, to make it uh, more palatable. So uh, to the extent that anybody is uh, shocked on any of these renderings, we certainly can understand, particularly on some of them. Uh, but this is a starting point that can only get better from here. And we look for that public feedback, uh, please, to help us guide that uh, enhancement and improvement of these designs as we go forward with the study. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Escarpa, Chief of our Watershed Section and our Environmental Analysis Branch to talk about the NEPA compliance work that's being done on this study. Chris? Thank you. Thank you, Bryce. I hope I'm, I'm being heard okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. As many of you, I'm sure, are keenly aware, um, we are uh, required um, under the National Environmental Policy Act uh, to consider the potential environmental impacts of our proposed actions and um, look at reasonable alternatives under the, um, the umbrella of the National Environmental Policy Act, along with many other laws and regulations. Um, we are, uh, we are of course, um, working that along with the, uh, and, and that is being done in coordination with um, regulatory agencies along the way. And uh, through the NEPA process, we are involving um, input from the public and regulatory agencies. Next slide, please. Okay, so the National, so the Council on Environmental Quality provides provides for three types of NEPA analysis um, based on the significance for impacts and based on the complexity and scale of the study, the team is preparing a tiered environmental impact statement. Um, the tier one draft environmental impact statement is included in the feasibility report, which has been released to the public uh, for review. And um, we are currently in the comment period as many of you are also, I'm sure, keenly aware um, that comment period closes um, on March 7. So the, um, I just wanna emphasize that right now we're working uh, through the first tier um, environmental impact statement um, that is being done right now as part of the feasibility stage um, phase of the, the project. And um, the tier two, uh, tier two or several tier two environmental impact statements will be prepared in the pre-construction engineering and design phase of this of the project, um, following authorization 
and um, and would be completed potentially in in multiple um, in multiple tier two EISs or um, or in different phases. So that is that is the next phase. But during this feasibility uh, study, we are conducting the tier one at this point. Now that is a, um, a broad level, big picture conceptual review of the alternatives. And the tier two would be a more site specific detailed review um, as the designs are further, further refined. Something important that I, I always like to note is that, um, you know, under the tier one level analysis, um, we are looking at this broad level and we, we recognize that additional analysis needs to be completed. Um, but, it, but I always remind all, all our listeners that the uh, project will not be constructed until we complete both the tier one and tier two environmental impact statement on, our, on the um, project components. And only when those are fully complete and all permits are obtained, will we um, proceed with construction on this project? Um, and and uh, so I think you can advance the slides, Bryce, thank you. Okay. Pardon me as I jump ahead a little bit. The US Army Corps of Engineers Engineering Research and Development Center developed the New York Bite Ecological Model to aid in assessing impacts of the alternatives being considered in this draft report. A conceptual visual model, a visual of the model is shown here on this slide and includes an assessment of six ecosystem types present within the New York Bite, ranging from marine to freshwater ecosystems. The results of the, the NIBEM, as we're calling it, are presented in the draft report uh, for agency and stakeholder review. And following additional input, it will be incorporated into the impact assessment of the final uh, tier one EIS. Next slide, please. Now, um, a notable comment we received during scoping and during the interim report review periods on this study has been uh, a desire for a more comprehensive environmental justice analysis. And so, um, in coordination with the Engineering Research and Development Center, ERDIC, um, as well as with the state of New York and New Jersey and the New York City Mayor's Office on Climate and Environmental Justice, we prepared a preliminary analysis of um, other social effects, which is one of our accounts that we use for plan formulation um, and environmental justice under NEPA. Now, um, something on this that I just wanna note is that we did this analysis that we've conducted, which can be viewed in Appendix A A12 of the um, feasibility report, is a very broad level in consistent with the um, analysis that was completed for the rest of the Tier 1 EIS. Um, additional analysis we recognize certainly um, will have to be carried out going forward. Um, so again, this, is, this was done at a very broad level. Um, so under the other social effects analysis, we look at things such as um, things affecting vulnerability, such as low income poverty level, uh, the elderly and the very young, disabled persons, female heads of household. And um, the framework utilized to assess the effects of the alternatives included physical and mental health and safety, economic vitality, social connectedness, identity, social vulnerability, Ability, participation, recreation, and leisure. Um, we uh, we we used a the framework that we used, as you can see here, uh, for defining defining disadvantaged communities was um, in keeping with the tier one broader level analysis. Very simple. Um, we we used the um, 23.59 percent or more of population below the federal poverty level and 51.1 or more of the population identified as minority in order to isolate uh, census tracts which met the criteria for disadvantaged communities. And this, is, this was consistent with the New York State's um, criteria at the time. Um, and then also to look at environmental burdens, we were using the EPA's EJ screen. 
Um, we did look at CEQ's um, tool, which was in a beta version uh, at the time, but um, we recognized that, that those tools were going to be evolving and advancing. And so um, our analysis was um, pretty well streamlined, but also allowed us to look at layering of um, things such as environmental burdens, but also those additional vulnerability factors. Um, and uh, and I guess the you know the as far as alternative three B goes, as the colonel had mentioned, um, we you know overlaying the alternative and the um, the risk managed areas behind alternative three B, we identified roughly sixty three percent of the census tracts um, having met the criteria that we were using for disadvantaged communities. Um, this is. This is a this is this is a great thing. It shows that there there will be there would be benefits to disadvantaged communities as a result of the construction of the project. But we also recognize that some of our features do touch on those uh, census tracts. So some of those areas, some of those communities, and groups of uh, groups within those communities may have um, may have at least temporary impacts, but also may have some long term impacts if our projects impact. Um, things such as uh, visual impacts, um, or view shed, and uh, impacts to recreational space. So there's a lot more to be done here, but I, I, uh, I think, um, you know, and, and certainly a lot of that is going to come from feedback that we received during this comment period. But um, I just want to emphasize that uh, along with the rest of our environmental impact uh, statement, we are also at that tier one level with this. And so um, there would be additional analysis done to look at uh, how these communities will be impacted by the project as the design um, is advanced. So that was just a little bit on the environmental justice. Um, I'm, you know, I'm here uh, throughout the day. So happy to discuss any more um, aspects of our our NEPA compliance or our, our EIS. Thank you all. I think that with that, do I turn it over to you, Colonel? I, I can cover it if you like. Uh, Thanks, Chris, Bryce. Uh, sure. Uh, just as, uh, you know, after the March 7th uh, close, comment, current comment closing date, um, the next milestone that we have is what we refer to as an agency decision milestone. Uh, that's currently scheduled for June, uh, and that basically would be, okay, we're going to go forward with alternative 3B, or it's possible that one of the other alternatives could be advanced, or another option is a locally preferred plan if the non-federal sponsors, the two states and the city, would like to see some variation off of uh, the five conceptual alternatives that we've laid out uh, to be advanced. And then uh, depending on how that falls within the scope that we had developed previously, we need at that point, we'd also probably seek an additional exemption for possibly additional time due to the extended public outreach we had, not only now, but also on the interim report uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, maybe a, an adjustment on the overall study budget. But we're looking to uh, basically end the study uh, with that chief of engineers report, which concludes the study uh, in 2024. It's currently approved for June of 2024, but that might get extended sometime later that year. But that's kind of our overall schedule. Um, given that we had a couple of years in uh, 2020 and 2021, when the study was largely paused for lack of federal funding. So um, with that, that kind of concludes our presentation. This is that web link uh, for our website, as well as the story map uh, uh, website address. If anybody would like to learn more information, all the draft reports, 600 pages, and a good executive summary, and then all the appendices all told over 4,000 pages of information are there. The list of all the upcoming meetings, virtual and in-person ones that we have scheduled. There's four of them, I believe, we have now in person throughout the study area plan for in February. We might have a couple more. Um, and then if there are other uh, groups or organizations that would like to have a specific separate briefing also, we're trying to accommodate those as best we can uh, while we're still in this common closing period. And of course, uh, once we get through the common closing period, we are looking to not, you know, end uh, public discussion and dialogue on the study, but figure out mechanisms as we go forward to, to kind of continue and, and further this exchange. So this is the start of a journey that hopefully will make 
the study area more resilient and more uh, uh, better managed in terms of coastal storm risk, not the end of it. Um, and as you know, the Chinese proverb, <laughs> journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So hopefully we can take a few of them here today. Thank you everybody for uh, their uh, patience as we go through the plan that we have. I'll turn that back over now to uh, uh, the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those presentations. And I will pass it over now to Kate Boycourt for the final presentation of this session. Um, Kate, you can take it away. Thank you, Katie. Um, and I'm not sure my video is enabled, but I will share my, my screen. Hold on just a second. All right. So um, can everybody see my screen? Yes, yes. We, we can, but we're looking at presenter view. Weird. Um, let me just display settings. Um, escape. Uh, ah. um, all right. You know what? Why don't we just go to the slide presentation that you all have in the uh, thing? Because I feel like it's going to take me a second to. Um, uh, wait, let me just see. Okay, ah. please stop sharing so we can switch it over. Yep. So before we jump in, uh, and while that's being loaded up, I just want to say thank you to everybody for, for being here today, and thank you to the core, thank you to Rebuild by Design for, for hosting us, um, but also to all of you. I think whether you're a government official or whether you're a nonprofit organization or just somebody interested in this in this process, um, the, the fact that you're here today shows how much you care about the future of our, our harbor and our, our city and, and New Jersey, and, and it's it's just really, really critical that, that we engage at this time. So I just want to thank you for your engagement. Um, next slide. So just a quick overview. I'm going to try, I think my job is to uh, bring up some of the time, so I'll try to go through quickly, but I'll talk a little bit about the context, why we're here, why this study, how it fits into a lot of the other work that's being done across the region, uh, a little bit about U.S. Army Corps projects that have been done in the region and elsewhere, uh, why, why we want to weigh in and how, a little bit of history of some of the advocacy that uh, has been happening around this study uh, to date and some of the national policy changes that might actually shift uh, future approaches and potentially even the approach of this study over time. And then some next steps of, of how you can get involved. Uh, next slide. So I think it's important to recognize that this is really hard stuff uh, for everybody. Uh, obviously, the Corps of Engineers has thousands of pages um, explaining and showing you how complicated it is to adapt our region uh, to the, the flood risk that we already have, um, much less the future. Um, and and also, it's it's really you know, this is changing the, the fabric of our communities, regardless of whether we're talking about greenhouse gas reduction or adaptation to climate change. These are some of the largest transformations that we really need to make in order to adapt to our future. And so I just want to reflect that this stuff is hard and multifaceted. Um, as as the Colonel and Bryce mentioned, this a lot of a lot of this work, including this study, were really spurred on by Hurricane Sandy. And I would say that pretty much all of the activities that you've seen really ramped up across both states uh, in the region and the nation on this have, have been really impacted by that event uh, particularly. And I think they kind of fall into about six buckets and I've, I've bolded sort of the buckets that uh, this study really fits into. So there's uh, planning and ideally, you know, when we're planning for flooding, we're thinking on the scale, uh, we at least have some sort of framework for thinking on the scale of a watershed or a subwatershed, or at least the scale of which flooding happens. Um, and then that's done uh, with an understanding of the kinds of uh, hazards that we have, as Bernice highlighted, and then how those hazards intersect with the community and what's feasible. And then ideally, there's a community based process in which what's feasible and uh, you know, what's possible are, are negotiated and developed into a plan and then funded. And I just wanna highlight some really great work um, in addition to this, this larger project that we're looking at right now, Rebuild by Designs work, of course, uh, in several areas to develop projects through uh, a great planning process, 
Also, the state of New Jersey has been bringing together municipalities and counties and community organizations and funding them to develop uh, sort of regional, sub-regional plans uh, through the Resilient NJ uh, program, and then many other studies, uh, neighborhood studies led by the city and others. Um, there's also a great map that, that uh, Hillary Ho will be talking about later in terms of community-based planning. Um, second, regulatory reform. I think Caleb will speak about this a little bit later, but ensuring that the way that we build or don't build going forward from building code to zoning to other land use regulations, that those are adapted for the present and the future. We've, we're a little bit behind in that, um, and we've already really renegotiated our, our relationship with the land in a way that's that's perpetuated a lot of the, the risk that we see today until we really sort of dig out of that. Um, emergency preparedness and response. There's a ton of work going on uh, between emergency management agencies and communities to try to ensure that the social networks, the shelters, the outreach is all sort of there for if a, a acute disaster is, is encroaching. And there's also an education piece of that um, that, that makes sure that not only uh, folks know about what's possible and, and the existence of climate change, but what they can individually do, ranging from moving their car if they have one before a, a, a acute event or, or actually relocating if they are evacuated or even just small changes within their home that they can make um, to, to make sure that they're safer. And then we're really in the in the, the area of infrastructure development and repairs right now, as I said, and, and Bernice highlighted, we have this tremendous, tremendous risk. And so how do we dig out of that? And that's a range of everything from some of the flood walls and, and proposals that uh, Bryce has highlighted to actually buyouts, floodplain restoration, and fundamentally changing our relationship with water. Um, I think this is really the largest sort of uh, study and and project consideration since the Robert Moses era. And we really need to think about what we want that future to look like. And so that's why we're all here today. Lastly, funding. This is where this, this project also fits in in the context of funding in that um, this is one of a few federal uh, ways to get money to regions for flood control projects and other types of projects, ecosystem restoration. Uh, and so it's an important resource along with uh, FEMA also has sort of a, a large program called the uh, FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. And then there's several others. We also have seen a lot of increased investment uh, with a passage of recent two recent uh, climate bills um, at the federal level, but also the Environmental Bond Act that good job, New York, uh, maybe New Jersey can, can uh, do one of these. Uh, we got $4.2 billion for resilience and climate projects uh, that we'll be able to spend over the next 10 years. And some of those include buyouts and nature-based uh, resilient solutions. Next slide. So I think uh, the Colonel really highlighted this, um, but I just wanna reiterate sort of where we're at. Um, and your opportunity to engage is now. So that's uh, really through commenting, through showing up and providing input here today, and then also engaging potentially with your congressional members about your perspective, as well as uh, the non-federal sponsors, the states of New York and New Jersey and the city of New York. Um, and they're really the decision makers, those non-federal sponsors in this time timeline um, before the Civil Works Review Board. So right around number three, agency decision milestone, uh, that's where they either say yes or, or no uh, to the project. And that's that's a critical time. And, and I think um, you know now is the time to engage with them about your perspective on the study. Um, and then once the chief report is, is moves forward, if, if that is the path uh, that we continue on, um, then Congress will have to be engaged to both authorize, so allowing the, the study to turn into more of a design and construction plan and appropriate money. Both of those things happen in two different bills um, and advocacy uh, is also needed around those times um, should there be large public support for that study. Um, I should say that advocates have proposed for extending this period even beyond uh, what has been uh, given so far and uh, had to have a more iterative approach to this, just given the complexity, size, and how, how far the study reaches across the region. 
uh, in our in our different communities, and that's something that we continue to to push for. Uh, we have been successful in, in uh, advocating for this large extension that we have right now, um, but really think that given the complexity and size of this study, there there needs to be a longer uh, and more engaged process. Next slide. Um, and I should also just reiterate again, I think you saw this in the slide and you can check this after the study that that uh, timeline of um, once once it is authorized, um, design and development takes about five years and then construction uh, is, you know, up to 15 years for different different measures. Um, so a few highlights of what can the core do? Uh, if you're not familiar, they can do a whole wide range of things from oyster restoration, habitat restoration. The, the core has done this in our region already. Uh, wetlands restoration in Jamaica Bay, you'll hear about oysters from Pippa, um, and also flood control. We've got flood control projects going on in our region um, from the sort of more um, flood wall approach and levee approach that we've seen on Staten Island to uh, dunes and planted uh, grasses over in Rockaway. Um, and also the Corps has a really important uh, navigation and dredging role to ensure that ships can move in and out of our harbor. Next slide. There's also a few flood control projects in other regions. And I should just say that the EDF is working across the country and especially in, in several regions highlighted here um, where there's many different approaches to flood control that might fit the needs of a certain area. Um, in Louisiana, we there, there are several projects that have already been built um, after Hurricane Katrina and, and New Orleans, but also there's a huge effort uh, and the Restore the Mississippi Delta Coalition has been pushing largely for um, sediment diversion. So making making sure that we're actually making there's the, this, this, the soil to uh, support wetlands uh, replenishment over time and ability to keep up with sea level rise. Um, we're really reconnecting uh, our, our delta to that, that source of sediment that helps, helps those wetlands survive and protect the region. Um, and there was a huge milestone in that decision making in the Barataria area uh, just this past December. In San Francisco Bay, their primary concern there is sea level rise, and there's a huge partnership with the Corps and many different entities across the Bay region to um, restore uh, salt marshes actually in these salt ponds and also create an integrated levee and, and natural protections. Um, in Galveston Bay, there's a mixture of, of gray and green uh, efforts. Um, I've highlighted some of the gray efforts, but there are some dune restorations uh, surrounding this area, but there's a surge gate that's been proposed, uh, sort of similar uh, in, in concept to uh, some of those that, that we'll hear about today, uh, but also a ring wall to connect to some of that um, effort and, and protect Houston. Keep, uh, keep going. And I just wanted to highlight Miami-Dade County. This is an area where EDF is, is pretty involved and it's in a really interesting time. Um, this sort of more sensational piece, and I know Bryce and the Colonel alluded to this, it, you know, there's this um, rendering sometimes that, that, that we look at at this early stage. Um, and I think this is illustrative of why it's really important to engage throughout this process so that we can really hear from you as to what you, your future you want it to look like. So you might have seen in the news, if you haven't, you can check it out. There was a large pushback in the Miami-Dade region against a, a seawall that was proposed um, in this area. And uh, folks really were frustrated by that process and pushed the Miami-Dade to actually, um, and the mayor to, to reject the plan um, and go towards a locally preferred alternative. Um, so they're actually, they've worked together, the Corps of Engineers and Miami-Dade to um, have a new process, or it's sort of an extended version of, of the previous process where they're doing a more charrette-based iterative approach. And it will be determined what that study will look like, but they are working more hand-in-hand -hand now and having a lot more public meetings to get input on, on this project. Um, and that sort of goes back to Bryce's point about a locally preferred uh, plan. Um, there, there is this opportunity if, if there is a no on the approach for the local sponsors to say, hey, we wanna go a different route. Um, but I encourage you all to weigh in now because I think there's an opportunity to get a, a good project out of this, uh, especially the more that, that we weigh in and, and give the course some feedback. Next slide. 
I think Bryce really covered this, but I just wanted to, to highlight and encourage you to look at the plan. And I'm happy to help sort of point if you have a question about where in your community you can you can find a map that shows either what's happening there, or interpreting that map, or looking at the, some of the renderings for that area. But take a look. The core really needs feedback in specifics about what's what's important to you and your community and what you want that to look like. I can sit here, I'm a resident of New York City, but we're co our comments are gonna be focused on the entire study. And we wanna amplify community content, the comments where we can, um, but you know, I'm, I may not know <laughs> what's happening at your street end that you really wanna maintain. So I think that's critically important that you, that you amplify those, those voices and those perspectives locally. That's something that the core really needs to know is those granular details. Next slide. So a little, little uh, overview of sort of how we've engaged thus far. And by we, I mean a, a lot of environment and climate justice focused organizations. And I really wanna shout out, especially to Tyler Taba and the Rise to Resilience Coalition. If you're not aware of what it is, check it out. Uh, you should join, everybody should join. It's a large coalition that's really pushing for a lot of different policy projects um, and legislative reforms at, at state, local and federal levels uh, to benefit the resiliency of the region. Um, we, we've done a few things together, uh, so especially with Rise, Rise to Resilience and uh, Riverkeeper and, and EDF and, and others have worked uh, really hard to um, both sort of amend federal law uh, to and how this study was authorized as well as others uh, for a few different priorities, which I'll highlight in just a second. We've also worked a lot with the non-federal sponsors and uh, Congress to get an alignment around several priorities and organizing many different groups toward that end. Um, and we've also advocated for resources for the Army Corps itself to both uh, keep the study going and also to get more research and development dollars uh, to really support a, the, the Corps analysis and, and that kind of thing. Lastly, I just want to shout out and, and thanks uh, also to the New York Community Trust for supporting EDF's national work on equity and natural approaches and cost benefit analyses. There's a lot of talk about cost benefit analyses. I see some in the chat. Um, and there's some changes that I'll talk about in a minute that, that might actually be coming down the pipeline. Um, so the way that the Corps of Engineers and, and the team can speak much more in much more detail to this historically has really, for this type of study, focused on uh, the economics and the, the physical damage associated with storms, and particularly storm surge. And that was the sort of one big type of flooding that, um, that Bernice mentioned. Um, there's other ways that they can kind of incorporate the costs associated with storms, income losses, emergency costs, the cost of deploying police and things like that but a huge primary part of it is physical damage. Um, they also have other accounts and you will, you will see that mentioned um, and I'll, I'll go into more detail about some of the changes there, uh, but we can consider the environmental social uh, benefits as well for these projects, but overwhelmingly the way that they are determined whether or not they move forward or not is whether or not that physical damage number um, is avoided by, by these costs and benefits. And um, another sort of limitation that we've been sort of focused on, um, and you can go to the, the next slide, is, um, is really the, the inability of um, this, this study and, and other studies to connect to what are the physical damages associated with tidal flooding over time, uh, given in a longer term time frame. Uh, that's why we focused on sea level rise and tidal flooding and multiple flood hazards, because depending on the solution, whether it's a flood wall or a levee or a surge gate or a buyout, um, the relative costs and benefits of that particular measure may may change depending on what type of flood hazard you're considering. And if you do not tie that tidal flooding in the long term uh, to that hazard analysis, you might not actually get a real sense of what is the best solution for the long term, uh, especially given the, the sort of maintenance commitment and long term construction timelines for these types of projects. So um, that's something that, uh, you know, we're trying to think about in, in cost benefit analyses and also um, in terms of multiple flood hazards. So a lot of advocates have been pushing for incorporation of multiple flood hazards 
um, for uh, several years, and we've been able to get specific language in the Water Resources Development Act to direct all studies to uh, be able to consider those multiple flood hazards. There was an update to that in this, uh, this 2022 Water Resources Development Act that we pushed for. Um, we also, specifically for this study and, and more broadly, we've been advocating for an iterative and public engagement process uh, responsive to the needs of those most impacted. Uh, we got some language in the Water Resources Development Act of, of 2020 uh, specifically for this study to do that. I think um, we really still feel like it, the, the engagement for this scale of study has been insufficient and that's something that we we continue to want to, to pursue. And that's why I think it's really great that we're hosting this meeting today. It's a great opportunity. Um, a phased approach as the study could take many years, over decades to, to fully be uh, finalized. How do we prioritize and, and think about what to build first? Um, I think this really gets back to the equity and cost benefit analyses uh, questions um, and also a more holistic lens of racial, economic and ecological impact and equity. So just two things we're doing on that. One is we've been engaging in environmental justice organizations across the nation to look at the way that FEMA and the core approach cost benefit analyses um, and um, suggest and, and think about what are some of the opportunities for incorporating more environmental benefits and social justice benefits into these studies, or at least a lens through which to maybe think about prioritizing. And then specifically, we've requested some data from the core for this project um, to look at how different areas, how they sort of rank in terms of benefiting uh, state designated disadvantaged communities. And that might be able to help us think about how do we create a phased approach that prioritizes those that most need it, um, those that get the greatest impact, and also um, how do we authorize it in a way that creates the most flexibility uh, for the core and the partners going forward so that we really can revise these studies uh, and, and plans over time. Next slide. So there's been a couple of exciting, um, exciting uh, directions um, that have been uh, been going on at the federal level, um, but a lot of this is yet to sort of play out. And I'll, I'm hoping to wrap up really soon, so I'll go really quickly. Um, one is consideration of multiple benefits and cost benefit analyses. Um, there is a really interesting directive um, for the core to incorporate and consider environmental and social benefits in, in the cost benefit analysis, as well as that econ economic, so that they're thinking about comprehensive benefits. But the way that they specifically that is done is, is sort of, I think, still in development. So this is a time when maybe we can engage on this and think creatively about, about how to do that. Um, second is the Justice 40 initiative that the Colonel mentioned, um, really making sure that, that at least 40% of, of benefits for these federal projects are going towards environmental justice communities. And so that's why I think it's important to look from the core's lens as well as state designated and other, um, other ways to think about justice and making sure that we're reaching those that are most impacted by climate change. Um, lastly, I mentioned the Water Resources Development Act, and there's a couple other things that I didn't mention. Um, there's, there's increased uh, guidance for, for how to assist low wealth um, a tribal and communities of color in this recent Water Resources Development Act. Um, and then also um, there's, there's new language directing the, the Engineering Research Development Center uh, to do a national coastal mapping study. Um, and then next slide. So again, I would just want to shout out, uh, connect to rise to resilience. I know Tyler and I are connecting on uh, Monday about having maybe a, a little bit of a sharing of, of comments. We're doing a ton of sort of technical comments at EDF and with partners and would love to share those with you when we've got them ready so that we can compare notes. Uh, definitely join NPCA's How to Comment one-on-one -on, -one on the February the 9th. Um, and reach out if you have any questions for me or if I can connect you to any activities. Um, so thanks so much. All right, thank you so much, Kate. And thank you to all of our panelists. We have about 10 minutes for questions um, and we have a lot of questions that have been coming through. I appreciate all of your engagement on this. I just wanna remind you all that we do have five more sessions and a lot of those sessions will go into more detail and we'll probably um, touch on answers to these questions. And then also at 5.30 at the end of the day, 
there'll also be more time for questions with the core. Um, but we'll see what we can fit in right now. So starting with, I did see a bunch of, a couple of general questions about slides and recordings and wanted to let you know that all of the slides and recordings for each session will be made available on the Rebuild by Designs website after the event. So you'll be able to share those and access those. Okay, and starting off, um, we did have a lot of interest in this cost benefit analysis. And I believe we might've missed some of the Colonel's comments on that because of the technical interruption. So um, could someone from the core please address the cost benefit analysis and how it works? And then specifically, there are some follow-up questions about how does the cost benefit analysis uh, consider environmental justice communities? And also are future maintenance and operational costs for mitigation features included in that analysis? Uh, so uh, quite a few questions there. Uh, this is Bryce Weismar. I'll offer up a couple of points. Uh, our economic analysis, um, there, there are four categories for looking at uh, that we define in the core for evaluating uh, benefits. Uh, the economics, uh, at least in terms of the, you know, the damages avoided uh, by putting these features in place are basically one of those the four categories we refer to as, as national economic development. Uh, so we basically estimate going out into the future for the 275,000 structures that are in the study area, uh, how many uh, might get damaged and how much by the different storms with sea level rise occurring over that time period. And then when we put these features in place, how much of those damages are avoided by those features. And that counts as the benefits that you saw on that average annual uh, benefits uh, column in the table that the colonel showed. Uh, but that being said, uh, that's just looking at the, the strict economics. And there's actually a number of other areas of uh, national economic development benefits that we could look at and would look at with, as the study advances. Um, but we've also done other analyses. Back with the interim report, we had a GIS analysis that looked at other uh, characteristics, uh, used weighted factors that were given by the, the non-federal partners that we have, uh, looking at population density, uh, a variety of other approaches to it, uh, critical infrastructure, of course. Um, those all kind of correlate fairly well. Uh, and then even in the other three categories that we have, uh, ecological uh, improvements, um, restoration, uh, regional economic development, and then when it comes to environmental justice, that falls under the category of the other social effects. And so the, the EIS, as Chris had mentioned, uh, kind of evaluates on that uh, more particularly. Uh, there, there's still guidance coming out in terms of how we uh, just consider, but then incorporate some of those other registers. Um, but it's sort of while the area is so ubiquitous with critical infrastructure, uh, uh, disadvantaged communities, uh, as, as, as Christian mentioned, you know, our, our analysis points favorably, but that's, you know, th there's so many of those disadvantaged communities in the area. Uh, uh, what we're doing, uh, we need to look at it further, but, you know, we're uh, looking to try to advance uh, those new authorizations that Kate mentioned. Um, and I got to my higher authority office. Um, right now, a lot of it, uh, they tend to all correlate damages to structure, damages to critical infrastructure, damages to disadvantaged communities. Um, so we're, we're trying to address as much risk as we have feasible and environmentally acceptable. Uh, you know, as we, what we have is a framework we're looking to. Thank you. Um, thank you. Your, your audio got a little garbled at the end there, but I think we we got the answer. Um, Kate, I'm seeing in the in the chat here, did you want to follow up um, on that question about climate justice considerations? Um, yeah, I actually was trying to type the answer and I accidentally did answer live, but I will be really quick and just say, yes, that's absolutely the intention of this research that we're doing. And again, I think that nationally, uh, the core and FEMA and, and others are working on this. Um, so we're hopeful that between sort of their internal work and the advocacy work that uh, we can try to get to more consideration of these things. And, and maybe there's an opportunity in the study to, to highlight some of those opportunities. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, and following up on that, 
um, who would be thinking of maintenance and operations costs? Do we know who would be responsible responsible financially for those costs? Um, the the current core policy is for the operation and maintenance of the civil works projects that we construct to be done by non-federal sponsor or their uh, designate. Uh, that being said, there are a number of uh, similar uh, coastal storm risk projects that are operated and maintained by the core. So it's something that Congress certainly could change, but the default assumption is that the non-federal entities uh, sponsor their designate would be responsible for operating, maintaining these structures. And we actually do inspect them uh, periodically to make sure that they are in fact being operated and maintained as we um, lay out for them as the project is turned over at the end of construction. We've assumed cost in our estimates for operation and maintenance, as well as mitigation and real estate and everything that is inclusive to the, the project being advanced. Over. All right, thank you. Um, and we, we have about five minutes left for one or two more questions and we will get a five minute break before the next session, just to let everybody know. Um, so for the next question, um, could, could you please address how the protection of power related infrastructure will be addressed with the preferred plan? Uh, this, this is another question directed to the core. Uh, we, we have looked at the uh, power related infrastructure and other critical infrastructure as part of that GIS analysis. And uh, because that's also fairly ubiquitous throughout the study area, um, we, we haven't focused on it uh, exclusively by any means, uh, but you know that obviously would be benefited by a lot of these very structural measures that we've outlined in our framework. Uh, it's also worth noting that there have been, in addition to you know the other projects that the Colonel showed on that slide earlier, uh, literally dozens, if not hundreds, of resiliency and risk management projects on the type of in, uh, critical infrastructure that have been done by uh, various. Um, companies and non-federal agencies following Hurricane Sandy in the study area. So there is very likely to be on a lot of that critical infrastructure, some uh, redundancy, which I think is a good thing um, in terms of the protection on that, not just what our project might do, but then the protections that they've already put in place following Hurricane Sandy. Over. Thank you. Um, and I have to say most of these questions are directed to the core. So uh, you're gonna remain on the hot seat. So another question here is in other projects like this in other parts of the country, has there been difficulty in getting congressional authorization for work to proceed? Um, It's always difficult to get funding. Uh, funding is very scarce, but I think Congress recognizes the evolving and worsening risks that are involved uh, as reflected in the core's overall budget uh, and as it's increased over the years, and that it's uh, recognized that doing actions preemptively to try to reduce risk going forward in the future and damages going forward in the future is far preferable to um, you know, the life safety issues uh, and the people having to withstand, having to go through these storms. That being said, of course, a lot of the funding that we've received over the years, uh, and I expect this is the case pretty much throughout the country, has been in response after a, a terrible storm has occurred. So um, it, it, it's, the funding is always difficult, um, but, you know, the, I, th I think Congress has, has shown through the appropriations and authorizations that they've given and how they have increased over the years um, an acknowledgement of those evolving risks and the need to address them. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, and thank you to all of the panelists. We've already had so much information this morning. Um, so we're going to wrap it up and take a, a quick break and returning at 11.15 for the next session.